Hello everyone, this is a two-part series on the perturbation solution method and how it is used in Dynair. In this first part, we will go through the theory in a general framework, also known as the linear rational expectations model, and cover the general idea, the notation, and the approach to approximating the policy function of any DSG model at first order. We will also implement the algorithm in MATLAB and, and compare it to the solution that Dynair provides. So this part should really enable you to understand the theory, intuition and approach of first order perturbation techniques. In part two of the series, we will then do an exact illustration of how Dynair concretely computes the first order solution. We will cover all the numerical tricks and efficient linear algebra methods and functions that Dynair uses to actually shrink the size of the matrix equations and moreover we'll actually re-implement Dynair's DIN first order solver function uh, to make sure that we really understand what Dynair does. There's a link in the description of the video to all the materials and slides and mode files that I'm using in this video so we'll feel free to check this out. Let's go! All right, let's start with the linear rational expectation solution. So first of all, let's talk about the DSGE model framework that we are considering. So very generally speaking, the model is given basically by two equations. Here, T and S um, denote the discrete time index, so typically the natural numbers or the whole numbers. Um, YT are our endogenous variables, and we have N of those. So these are the variables that in Dynair you declare in a var block. Then we have ut, we have nu exogenous variables, so those are the variables that you declare in the var exo block. And we have the covariance matrix of the exogenous variables, um, this is what you declare in the shocks block. And then we have model parameters, theta, theta so what you declare in a parameters block. And we have our model equations f, and we have n endogenous variables, so we also need n model equations. So those are the equations that you type in in the model block. Now, this notation f indexed by theta basically means we have a continuous nonlinear function which is indexed by a vector of parameters theta. Now let's talk about rational expectations. Okay, so there's an expectation operator conditional on some information set. And the information set that we typically have include all the model equations, the value of parameters, the value of the current state of the economy, yt minus one. We observe current exogenous variables, ut, and the agents also know the invariant distribution but not the values of future exogenous variables, ut plus one, ut plus two, etc. So if you're a little bit familiar with probability theory, um, the information set is actually more formally a filtration, so the current information set will be included in future information sets. More formally, what is in the information set of the agents? The knowledge of the model equations, the values of the parameters, the current state of the economy, current shocks, and the distribution of future shocks, but not their values. And typically we have a shorthand notation for this expectation conditional on the filtration, um, which is simply we write ET. So this is our DSG model framework. And let's use the shorthand notation all right, now what is the perturbation approach? Let me first give you a general idea. There are several steps to doing a perturbation approach. So the first step is we are going to introduce a parameter, a perturbation parameter, that is able to scale the stochastics in my model. Okay, so let's scale those exogenous variables by a parameter sigma, which is either zero or some positive number. And if that number is very high, then the covariance matrix will be also very high. If it is very small, that number, then the covariance matrix will also be very small. In other words, if sigma is large, then there is huge uncertainty in my model. If sigma is very small, there is just a bit of uncertainty in my model. And if it is zero, zero there is no uncertainty in my model. 
And this enables me to distinguish between the static model, so setting sigma equals to zero, and the dynamic model whenever sigma is positive. Now the second step is let's define a concept for a solution and we will do this by introducing a mapping between my endogenous variables in period t and what is in my information set, the current state of the economy and I observe current shocks. Okay, so given those two variables, I want to have a mapping that tell me how the agents optimally react such that I can provide values for all my endogenous variables yt in period t. And this mapping is recursive. Okay, so and let's call this mapping function g and this function is typically called a policy function or decision rule. Now, g is unknown. There is basically, at least I'm familiar like with three, four models where I can write down this function in closed form. For all other cases, we have to somehow approximate this function. Mathematically speaking, we need to solve a functional equation, which is a very hard thing to do. Now, let me formulate an idea. Maybe we can get g out, well, g is unknown, maybe we can get it out from something that is known, my model equations. So let's use the policy function on my model equations. So let's define um, the policy function for yt and for yt plus one. Uh, notice then I can insert this yt over here. So for yt plus one, I have this double g function right there. And using that, I can rewrite my dynamic model. Um, basically, yt minus one is known. Then use the policy function for yt and use the policy function for yt plus one. And now I have rewritten my dynamic model in terms of current states, current shocks, future shocks, and the perturbation parameter sigma. And this implicitly defines the function g. So perturbation is based on the implicit function theorem. What is known are the model equations and inserting the policy functions, the model equations of course also have to be fulfilled whenever, <laughs> uh, otherwise g wouldn't be a solution to that. Now this implicitly defines my unknown policy function g. So I have created a connection between those two. But still, I have no idea how this function g looks like. But what we do know is one point of that unknown function, and that is the steady state. Okay, so we know how to solve for the non-stochastic steady state. So let me set sigma equal to zero, no stochastics in my model, I'm in the static model, and I can solve the static model equations. I can either do this we're using uh, pen and paper by hand analytically in closed form or I'm using some numerical opti optimization method or function to get a fixed point, a steady state of my model equations. So this is well defined. And then of course there is the connection between the model equations and the policy function. So if I'm in my steady state and nothing happens, the optimal decision is I stay in the steady state. So even though I do not know what g looks like explicitly, I do know its value at the steady state. Now perturbation is basically based on Taylor approximations. So let's first start with a Taylor approximation, a first order Taylor approximation of my policy function g. Taylor approximations, you start at a point where you want to evaluate this, And then you add the first derivative of g with respect to y t minus one times the change from the variable from the point that you're approximating in. And then the second partial derivative, uh, sorry, and then the p derivative of g with respect to u times the change of u from the point you are approximating in. In steady state, of course, u is zero. And the same for sigma. Now, 
we did actually make some progress. We started in trying to find a or solve a functional equation. Now, instead of having possibly an infinite amount of parameters to define this unknown function g, I am left with one, two, three matrices. So these are still unknown, but these are matrices. And solving matrix equations is a much simpler problem. But still, how do we obtain these three matrices? Now, idea, well, we just did the Taylor approximation of G. G is connected to my model equations. So let's also do a Taylor approximation of my dynamic model equations. So before I do this, let me introduce a little bit of notation, which is very typical in the perturbation literature. Okay, so we basically uh, remove time indices and replace them with a plus or a minus. Okay, so u without any index means ut, u with a plus corresponds to ut plus one, and very similarly, y minus corresponds to yt minus one, y zero is yt, y plus will be yt plus one. And then I'm gonna collect the coefficients in my implicit function, uh, yt minus one, u, ut plus one, and sigma into a vector r, and the dynamic variables, so previous variables, current variables, future variables, and the exogenous um, into a vector z, and plug in the policy functions, this vector then looks like that. And similar notation for the Jacobian matrices. Okay, so gy will be the derivative of the policy function with respect to previous variables or with respect to state variables evaluated at the non-stochastic steady state. Uh, sorry, and so u will be zero and sigma will also be zero. Similarly, gu is the partial derivative with respect to u. g sigma will be the corresponding one with respect to sigma. Same notation for the partial derivatives of um, my model equations with respect to previous model variables, with current model variables, and with future model variables, and also with respect to shocks. Now implicitly we've defined this uppercase f and there were uh, four arguments to this function f. So let's take the derivative with respect to yt minus one fu with respect to ut and u plus and sigma. And again, all derivatives are evaluated at this non-stochastic steady state. And the what I'm looking for are those three matrices. Those are unknown. And what is actually known are the model derivatives, right? Because I've written down the function, so I can take either on, on paper, I can do that or make use of a symbolic toolbox or Dynair's preprocessor to compute those model derivatives. So this is actually known and implicitly we therefore also have the connection between something unknown and known. So let's do the Taylor approximation of uppercase F and let's do a first order approximation. So I'm gonna evaluate the point where I want to do the approximation. So this will be the steady state plus the derivative with respect to the first argument times the change in the uh, argument plus the derivative with respect to the second argument times the change in the argument tip tip. Okay, so a hat notation, I will use that to denote uh, deviations from steady state. Okay. Now, our model implies that the conditional expectation with the information set in period t of those of the model equations must be zero. If the Taylor approximation is a good approximation, then the first order approximated functions also need to be zero when I take the conditional expectation. So evaluating the model equations in steady state is of course, uh, will of course be equal to zero. There is no uncertainty about the current state of the economy or the current shocks. 
but there is uncertainty. I'll take the expectation with respect to future shocks. And remember, I expressed future sho shocks, ut plus one, as sigma times epsilon t plus one. So let me collect terms. Now this equation needs to be zero. So for any values of y hat minus u and sigma, this equation needs to be fulfilled. And the only way for this equation to be true for any value of y hat or u or sigma is when those coefficient matrices are zero. So fy must be zero, fu must be zero, and f sigma plus fu plus times the first product moment of epsilon also needs to be equal to zero. And that's an important insight. We have now three multivariate equations, fy equals zero, fu equals zero, and f sigma plus fu plus times the first pro order product moment equals zero. And we're looking for three unknown matrices. So there is a natural connection. It is possible to recover gy out of fy equals zero, gu out of fu equals zero, and g sigma from the last multivariate equation. So let's start with that one. Okay, how do we recover g sigma? So let's take the first order derivative with respect to sigma. Okay, so first we have a sigma right there and we have a sigma there and there. Okay, so let's start, no sigma here, but there is one there. And I have an outer derivative, so f with respect to y zero, and I have the inner derivative g with respect to sigma right there. Next, I have a sigma there and a sigma here. So I basically have two inner derivatives. So let's first take the outer derivative, fy plus. And right here, I again have an another outer derivative. So gy and g sigma. And here I only have that g sigma inner derivative. Okay, so this is the first order derivative with respect to sigma. And similarly, with respect to u plus, there is only one u plus right here. So outer derivative with respect to y plus and g u. There you go. So the equation that I needed to solve was f sigma plus f u plus times the expectation of epsilon plus. Now, if you have a look right here, there is a g sigma there, there, there. I can pull it out to the right and reorder the equation. And then I have g sigma just on the left hand side. And this is known, this is known, this is unknown, this is known, this is known, this is unfortunately unknown. But wait a minute, I know the expectation of epsilon t plus one. Of course, that one is zero. So this always implies that g sigma will be zero. And this is known as certainty equivalence of a first order perturbation solution. And this has some serious implications for the solution method that you're using. So when we derive the actual model equations, the agents took the stochastic nature of the model into account. Now, the policy function, which is a description of how do the agents optimally behave if something happens in the model, if I deviate away from steady state, so say there is a shock U, how do we get back to steady state? So this is a recursive description of that. And with the first order perturbation approximation of that function, this is independent of the size of uncertainty in the model. Okay, remember sigma was a scaling factor. So if sigma is very large, we have a very large variance, therefore we have a huge uncertainty in my model. If it is very small, then there are, is basically just a little bit of uncertainty, or if it is zero, there is no uncertainty. And this doesn't matter at first order. Future uncertainty does not matter for the decision rules of the agents at first order. And this result is called certainty equivalence is just a result of a first order perturbation approximation. 
we can break it uh, with say higher order perturbation techniques or other solution methods like um, projection or value function iteration methods etc nevertheless this is important to take note of okay and most of the times this is fine because analyzing transmission channels of say fiscal policy monetary policy shocks is typically okay under this um, certainty equivalence paradigm on the other hand if you are interested in analyzing the risk premium in the model or how agents react if they perceive a higher probability of something really bad happening like a rare disaster a war or a pandemic if you're interested in such behavior then a first order perturbation approximation is not a good or even a valid uh, solution method okay so you should then look into other things but on the other hand the first order is still the workhorse it is very useful also if you want to go ahead and estimate your models um, because it has this nice linear structure okay now let's continue with recovering gu so the first step is let's take the derivative of uppercase f with respect to u there is no u here there is a u there there and there so let's start so let's take the outer derivative with respect to y0 and then gu outer derivative with respect to y plus then there is a u right there so another outer derivative gy and inner derivative gu and then the last argument is just the outer derivative fu now fu needs to be always equal to zero so let's rearrange the equation and i see that i have it on the left hand side this is a known function this is known hmm. this is unknown but this is also known so important insight this is just a linear equation okay i need to this is i mean this is just a matrix and i need to a jacobian matrix of course and i need to take the inverse of that matrix so once i know once i've computed gy i can easily solve this linear equation and i recover gu so what about gy let's start recovering that take the derivative with respect of uppercase f with respect to yt minus 1 so there's a yt minus 1 there there's a yt minus 1 here and there okay so f with respect to yt minus 1 is right here we have outer derivative with respect to y0 gy outer derivative outer derivative inner derivative fy plus gy uy and this equation is different than before i have a, an unknown here and i have unknown times unknown there so this is a matrix quadratic equation and this is not an easy equation to solve okay of course in the univariate case for quadratic equations we have formulas that are handy to solve um, those but for matrix equations we don't have such formulas so generally speaking it is impossible to solve this equation analytically but there are actually several ways to deal with this as this boils down to what is known in the literature as the solution to linear rational expectations models and that was a literature that basically started say in the 70s and the 80s up to 2000 uh, where people were thinking about how to solve such models how is that connected to perturbation let's go back let's consider my original dynamic model okay so let's take the first order Taylor expansion the steady state of that is of course zero so what I'm left is f y minus times y hat t minus one f y zero times y hat t f y plus times the expectation of y hat t plus one and f u times u t and this is formally known as a linear rational expectation model okay so let's again introduce the concept of the policy function let's rewrite 
that term as we did before, right? We get the double GY right here. This is of course zero. So we end up with this term. And let's rewrite the above equation, collect terms, and we see that this linear rational expectations model can be equivalently written down as all those terms, which are what we called Fy, and all those terms, which are what we called Fu. And for any value of y hat t minus one and ut, this equation needs to be fulfilled. And the only way that this can happen is when those coefficient matrices are zero. So, and this framework, this can be cast into a so-called structural state space system. So how do we do this? Let's write it into a matrix form. Okay, so let me put, or let me create two vectors, y hat t and et y hat t plus one, and the same vector lagged. So y hat t minus one and y hat t. And then I have this coefficient matrix goes there. Let's put this on the right-hand side. This coefficient matrix goes here on the right-hand side. Okay, so this times this plus this times this is basically this part in the upper rows. Then we have the FU right there in the upper rows and we have the yellow part right here in the upper rows. And in the lower rows, I'm basically just stating y hat t equals zero plus y hat t plus zero. So the lower rows basically just tell me y hat t equals y hat t. Now, what we've created is, if you're familiar, for instance, with structural VR models, um, is what we call a structural state space system. So there's a, a structural matrix D, there is a matrix E um, multiplying the first leg of the, of the vector of model variables. And there is a plus a term that contains the shocks. Now, D and E are by construction square matrices. So I am looking for recursive functions that given current states and current shocks will give me future variables. Huh, so why not just take the inverse of D, it's a square matrix, and then I have it, right? Let's do this. If that matrix D is invertible, then of course I could invert it and I would have such a recursive formulation. Looks like a vector autoregressive model of first order. And of course I can iterate that and this solution is stable only if that coefficient matrix right here, if the eigenvalues of, those, of that matrix are between minus one and plus one. So what we call our inside the unit circle. Okay, so this is in the univariate case, the, the, the question is if today happens a shock, the effect of that shock, does it eventually die out or not? And if that coefficient would be something like 0 0.5, then the next period the effect will be just 0 0.25 and then 0 0.125 it will eventually die out. This is what we would then call a stable system and in the multivariate case we simply look at eigenvalues. Okay, so stable solution if and only if all the eigenvalues, let's call them lambda, of that matrix are inside the unit circle. So what is an eigenvalue of a matrix? Um, well, an eigenvalue is the solution to an equation. Okay, so I have, I need to find eigenvectors and a value right here. And uh, if the matrix has dimension n, then I will have n eigenvalues. And this equation is basically the definition of an eigenvalue. Now, the problem, the huge problem that we have, D is not invertible. In almost all models. It is singular. Nevertheless, let's stick to this stability argument. I still want to have the eigenvalues inside the unit circle, but D is not invertible. So let's put it back on the left-hand side and ha let's have a look at this equation. And this equation is basically the definition of so-called 
generalized eigenvalues of two matrices D and E. Okay? Same idea, stability only if all the eigenvalues are inside the unit circle, so are they are in between minus one and one. And in MATLAB, you can uh, compute those very easily with the Ike function, and you simply plug in either one matrix if you want to compute the usual eigenvalues or two matrices if you want to compute generalized eigenvalues. And whenever you are faced with an equation where you cannot really take the inverse, what we typically do is try to do a matrix decomposition. And most solution methods for linear rational expectations are basically just use a different matrix decomposition. They will more or less all do the same thing um, and here I'm going to use a generalized sure decomposition. So again, remember the eigenvalue is defined via the equation that I've just shown, um, or you can also define it via a determinant of the matrix pencil. So the determinant of D plus lambda times E needs to be equal to zero. So let's do instead of the inverse, let's use a sure decomposition on the matrix pencil that is decompose that matrix D and E using four matrices. So I have, I have Q, I have Z, I have T and I have S. And those matrices are very special. Okay, so the general sure decomposition is a very general algorithm. Um, it is not unique, but it is general. And we will actually use that it's not unique uh, in a moment. So I can decompose, I can rewrite that matrix as Q prime the transpose of Q times T times the transpose of Z, and similarly the transpose of Q times S times the transpose of Z. And the matrix Q and the matrix Z are orthogonal, meaning that the transpose of the matrix is equal to the inverse. The matrix T is upper triangular and S is quasi upper triangular. So it could have zeros on the main diagonal, but the upper, um, but the lower tri part of that, m the lower triangular part of that matrix will be zero. Okay. Now, how do you do this decomposition? Well, there's simply a command for this in most programming languages. For instance, in MATLAB, uh, it is called a QZ decomposition. Okay. So. Let's go back. Let's look at generalized eigenvalues of D and E. Let's combine this decomposition with um, the stability argument. Now, generalized eigenvalues are actually computed from a sure decomposition. Okay, those generalized eigenvalues that MATLAB gave you when you include Ike of E and D is are the same values that you get if you do a sure decomposition and you simply focus on the diagonal of S and the diagonal of T, and you simply divide each of those with each other. Of course, there can be special cases. If the diagonal of T, there is a zero in there, um, then if the other diagonal is positive, we uh, define the eigenvalue as infinity. If it is negative, then we define the eigenvalue as minus infinity. So let's go back to my structural state space system. Let's insert the policy functions. Okay. And here I've marked with red all terms involving U. Okay. So I've uh, in inserted the policy function for Y hat T for Y, um, y hat T plus one. There was this term right there. This is zero, of course. And there's a y hat t right here. So let's put all the red terms on the right hand side. And let's see this and this and this looks very familiar. And the lower rows minus gu, u, gu, u, and zero. The lower rows of that red part are already zero. And actually, this guy, these expressions right here. This is what we called fu. And our solution, we need, or by definition, a solution is defined by fu being 
equals to zero. So zero, zero, I can get rid of that term. So this is the actual structural state space system after inserting the policy functions. Okay, now this is what I called the D matrix and the E matrix. Let's do the sure decomposition on that. So I get Q, T, Z, Q, S, Z. Let's multiply with Q. And I have that right here. Now T and S were special matrices. T was a triangular matrix and S was a quasi-triangular matrix. So now let's use the fact that the sure decomposition is not unique. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reorder the sure decomposition such that the eigenvalues that are stable inside the unit circle are in the upper left corner of T and of S. Okay, so this matrices T and S have this very special structure and if I take the diagonal elements of this matrix T11 and of S11, the eigenvalue can be computed by S11 divided by T11, so each um, element on the diagonal. And those will be all in between minus one and one. And the explosive eigenvalues, so those that are in absolute value larger than one, are on the T22 and S22, are in, in those matrices. And now I want to impose stability. Remember, the problem is on those eigenvalues that are in absolute value larger than one. Those will make my system explode. What we are going to do is let's focus on the lower rows right here and let's make sure to always make them equal to zero. Okay, so let's impose stability. So let's rule out these explosive behavior in the lower rows. How, how can we do this? Well, we have the yellow matrix right here and the same yellow matrix right there. And in the lower rows, I'm going to do zero times whatever is here, doesn't matter. This will always be zero plus T22 times whatever is here. And the same right, right here, just with the S22 matrix. So let's make sure that the lower rows are always zero. So whatever is, so let's compute this matrix and whatever comes on top here, I don't care, but I'm going to impose that this needs to be zero. So GY needs to be chosen such that this will be zero. And this will basically make sure that zero times XXX plus T22 times zero is zero. And the same with here, here right hand side, zero times XXX plus S22 times zero. This will all right hand side and left hand side are both equal to zero. Okay, so what does it mean? Um, what is XXX then? So let's pre-multiply by Z. Remember it is an orthogonal matrix. And let's focus on the upper rows right here. So we have Z11 times XXX plus Z12 times zero, which must be equal to the identity matrix. Or rearranging this XXX matrix right here after imposing stability needs to be equal to the inverse of the Z11 matrix. Now, how do we recover GY then? Well, let's focus on the lower rows now. Okay, so Z12 prime times the identity plus that matrix times GY must be equal to zero. All right, so let's rearrange. Now I finally have what I'm looking for on the left-hand side alone and on the right-hand side, I have stuff that is known. That's it, we have recovered GY. Of course, we have to make sure that we can actually compute this, okay? So we need to compute the inverse right here and we need to make sure that this is a square matrix right here, right? And those are the infamous Blanchard and Kahn conditions. So there is an order condition, this matrix Z22 needs to be square. And there is a rank condition, this matrix Z22 needs to be invertible, it needs to have full rank. 
So let's sum up the linear rational expectations solution, which enables me to find the perturbation solution of first order. It is actually a very simple algorithm. It involves quite the math at the core of it, but in terms of programming it, in terms of writing down the algorithm, it is actually quite easy. So what are these steps? Remember the first order solution has this form. It is a linear equation right here and I'm looking for matrices GY and GU because I have certainty equivalence G sigma will be equal to zero. And the algorithm is, well, let's first create those D and E matrices. They contain the Jacobians of the model equations with respect to the variables at t minus one, t and t plus one. This is known, evaluate those at the steady state, set up those D and E matrices. Then do a sure decomposition on these matrices with the reordering such that the generalized eigenvalues that are stable come first. Next, simply solve that equation. Once you have GY, simply solve that other equation and you get GU and you're done. Now, GY is a n by n matrix. The columns of those matrix, most of those columns will be actually zero columns because only the columns of so-called state variables will be non-zero. And this is also what we report in Dynair, we only report the non-zero columns. So only with respect to the so-called state variables, those are the ones that appear with a T minus one in your model and possibly also with a, a T, but not with a T plus one. Now the rows of that, as I've outlined it here, are in so-called declaration order. So the order you decide to introduce the names of the endogenous variables in the var block. The rows in Dynair's O, O, D, R, J, H, X, X matrix are actually in what we call the DR order. Again, I will talk about this in the second part in much more detail. For now, there is a reordering of variables so that um, static variables come first, then predetermined ones, then mixed ones, and then forward-looking variables. And similar for GU, it is a N by NU matrix and those rows right now are in declaration order, the way you declared the variables in the var block, but the matrix reported by Dynair is again in DR order. And we have a mapping between these two orderings. It's in the OO underscore DR structure. There's an order var a mapping and an inverse order var mapping to go from one ordering to the other one. But I will show you this in a moment. So I've just said that it is very easy to compute this. Um, so let's re-implement this in MATLAB. So let's take any mode file that you have. I have right here, I have a new Keynesian model with um, capital and investment adjustment cost with Calvert price frictions and uh, it is written down in its nonlinear form. So I have some auxiliary variables to derive the law of motion of the recursive price setting. Um, I declared additional reporting variables, a bunch of parameters. It doesn't really matter, just any mode file that you have, some parameterization, whether you can compute um, your steady state in an in, in val block or use a steady state model block, whatever. And Currently in this mode file, I'm just checking whether the steady state can be computed. I'm going to use Dynair version 5.4 and let's run this mode file. It doesn't do anything but just computing the steady state. So now let me illustrate the perturbation, the first order perturbation solution with um, Dynair first. So first of all, let me include the model equations that I've just shown you. And let me call this mode file now new Keynesian illustrate perturbation dot MOD. Okay, so if I run this now, it just does exact same thing that I just did before. It computes the steady state. Now, if you want to do stochastic simulations, uh, you first of all have to declare 
um, a shocks block with the variance or standard error of your uh, exogenous variables that sigma u matrix in my nodes. Okay, so here I'm going to assume that the TFP shock has a standard error of 0 0.3, the monetary policy shock a standard error of 0 0.1, and the preference shock a standard error of 0 0.5. And then you simply run Stoxemo. We are going to do first order perturbation solutions. And I want Danair to compute impulse response functions. So there's only one shock of one standard error. The size of that shock will be one standard error. Everything, all the other shocks are zero. And let's see, let's iterate on the policy function how we get back to steady state. Or let's draw 200 shocks for all the exogenous variables and let's iterate there again on the policy function. And this is how we compute or how we simulate time series in a model with stochastic simulations. So let me run this again. And now we see many things. Okay, so let's, me, let's first start in the command window right here. Okay, so we've computed the steady state. Then Dynair tells me a summary of the different types of variables. I will talk about this in the second part of the presentation. My covariance matrix. And this is where the policy and transition function is given to me. Okay, so you need to read this as y t is equal to a constant. And at first order, that constant will always be the steady state of that matrix y. Plus this number times kt minus 1 in deviation from its steady state plus this number times that variable in deviation from steady state. So those are the coefficients that are in my gx matrix. And then I also have my three shocks right here. Those are the coefficients in my gu matrix. And I have that for all declared variables. But note that only some variables are uh, here in the rows because those are the so-called state variables. Again, I'm gonna talk about those in a minute. Now, because I've simulated data, I can also compute the mean, the standard deviation, variance, skewness, and kurtosis of those data, or the correlation between the variables, or the autocorrelation. Um, I can also, given the linear state space system, I can also do a variance decomposition. So how much of the variance of, say, consumption is explained by the variance in the uh, TFP shock, in the monetary policy shock, and in the preference shock. Okay. And those numbers should ideally add up to 100% because I have just a small sample of 200 periods. They don't. But there's also a way to actually compute those uh, theoretically, not only in simulations. Um, okay. So, and also Dynair opened up, plotted by default, the impulse response functions. All right, many variables. Wonderful. Okay, I don't want to look at those all. If you look into your workspace, you also have those variables accessible to you. So for instance, let's focus on consumption. I wanted to have IRFs of uh, a horizon of 30. So I have the IRF of consumption with respect to the TFP shock, the monetary policy shock, and the preference shock. So I can plot those more nicely with my own MATLAB commands. And I also simulated data. So for instance, if I go ahead and just plot this variable C, you see I have 200 simulated points for my consumption. And you see we have something like business cycles right here. And these are all computed with the policy function, with the approximated policy function. Now, the approximated policy function in Dynea, the coefficients are given in GHX. So this is my G, G uh, th this is the GY matrix, but only focusing on the columns for state variables. And GU, this is the GU matrix. Now, let's try and recompute those numbers. First of all, let's extract variables from Dynair's uh, model structure. So I'm gonna need the name of the mode file, the values for the parameters, how many variables are in my model, 
um, how many static variables and how many state variables. Then I have this um, way to move from the declaration order to the DR order. I need this at the end to compare um, how close we are to what Dynair computed. The lead lag incidence matrix is a matrix that contains information about the columns in the dynamic Jacobian to which variables it corresponds to and the steady state for the endogenous and exogenous. Or let's use Dynair's script files to compute the dynamic Jacobian. So this lowercase f, y minus, f, y zero and f, y plus matrix. And for this, I first need to find out which variables actually appear in the model. This can be done by the lead lag incidence matrix. I'm gonna stick um, close to my um, presentation, call y the steady state of the endogenous. And then I need to um, replicate the steady state for the variables that actually appear in at t minus one, that actually appear at t and that actually appear at t plus one. So I'm, I'm just replicating this steady state vector and I'm creating this uh, vector for steady states of the dynamic variables um, and also for the exogenous ones. And then I can use Dynair's dot dynamic script file. If you look into the plus folder, you will find the dynamic first Jacobian G1, the second one and possibly also the third one. And But you can si simply call the dynamic, evaluate the dynamic one. I'm gonna evaluate this at the steady state for the dynamic variables, the steady state for the exogenous, the current parameters. And if I have a steady state operator, I also need to provide the steady state values for that. Um, and the exogenous variables should be evaluated at the first period. This does not really matter in a stochastic context here. Okay, so let me run this code. Okay, and let's see what I have. Okay, so let's have a look at fz. This is the Jacobian of my dynamic model. Now let's extract the submatrices. Again, I need an index for the variables that actually appear and this information is um, in the lead lag incidence matrix. And now I'm gonna create this fy minus, fy zero and fy Plus, I'm gonna create the full Jacobian. Since I don't want to distinguish the different types of variables yet, again, I'm gonna do this in the second part of the presentation, I am that that Jacobian needs to be size n by n. And now I'm gonna fill the variables that actually appear at t minus one, the columns of those with the corresponding entries of my full Jacobian right here. And the same code for fy zero and fy plus, I'm gonna call fy0 like that and fy plus like that. Okay, so you see that the one corresponds to t minus one, this is t and this is t plus one. And lastly, I also need the Jacobian with respect to shocks. This is fu, I can simply take the last exo number uh, columns of that matrix. Okay, so this is the difficult part since Dynair already computed script files for us. I'm just gonna use those to compute the Jacobian matrix. So no, we now have Fy minus, Fy zero, Fy plus and Fu. And now we can actually start with the first step. Let's create the D and E matrix, right? So how do they look like? This was the D matrix, this is the E matrix. So let's simply do this. Okay, so set up the D and E matrices with the correct Jacobians. The next step was to compute the generalized sure decomposition. And again, in MATLAB, there is this command QZ for that, which is actually the complex sure decomposition. Okay, so let me run this code up to here. Okay, so what does this generalized sure decomposition do? So first of all, the D matrix can be decomposed like that. So the norm of that matrix should be very close to zero. 10 to the power of minus 14 is quite close to zero. And the same for the E matrix. And now the generalized eigenvalues of that E and D matrix. Okay, so let's see. Some of them are infinity, they can be complex, whatever, right? 
and those can be basically computed via looking at the diagonal of S divided by the diagonal of T. Let's see whether we get the pretty much the same expressions here. I sort them right here and you see that MATLAB's Ike function basically just uses this um, as well. Okay, now next step is to reorder such that the stable eigenvalues come first. Okay, so let's reorder and MATLAB has a nice function ORT QZ and you there are different arguments to call that and this will make it such that the stable eigenvalues come first. Okay, so let's have a look at the eigenvalues. So you, you should see that the large eigenvalues are ordered last and here we have the stable eigenvalues. And note that we have loads of zero eigenvalues because we have so many static variables. All right, so next I want to have an index for stable and explosive roots. Okay, so let's find the eigenvalues that um, an absolute value smaller than one. So this is then the index of stable roots and the other one is the index of the explosive roots. Okay, once I have that index, let's create those Z11 and so on matrices. And actually, I just need two of those matrices, the Z12 and the Z22 matrix. So where the, I have the stable roots and explosive roots and I have the explosive roots. And then I need to check the Blanchard and Kahn conditions. Okay, so that was checking the order condition for Z22 and the rank condition for Z22. Okay, so if the length of my explosive roots is larger than all my variables here, because I'm not distinguishing types, then I get an explosive system. If it is smaller, I get uh, multiple solutions, so indeterminacy. And if the rank of that matrix is not full, then I have no solution due to rank failure. Okay, and then I can recover GY. GY was the inverse of that matrix, the transpose of that matrix times Z12, the transpose of Z12. Okay, so let me see, let me run this code again. GY. There you go, and you see that there is some complex parts here, but the complex parts is actually always zero. This is because we did a complex sure decomposition, so let's get rid of uh, the complex part. Let's call simply focus on the real part, okay? So there are some spurious imaginary parts right here. All right, now this is the GY. To compare it with Dynair, we need to focus on the DR order and we need to focus only on the state variables in the columns. Okay, so let's call, let me call that GX. So let's remap the rows to the DR order. Okay, so this is just remapping my variables to the DR order and also in the columns because this is now an N by N matrix. And now let's focus only on state variables. Those are the, once I have the DR order, I can easily access the state variables. Okay, this is, so now I have GY and GX. And since I have GY, I can also recover GU. That was the inverse of FY0 plus FY plus times GY times FU. And again, let's put this into DR order right here. And lastly, let's compare with what Dynair did. So let's first compare GX. Okay, let's, I simply took the, simply vectorized both my GX and Dynair's GHX. And you see, I mean there's, okay, this is 10 to the power of minus 16. They are basically numerically equivalent. Okay, let's compute the norm of the matrix 10 to the power of minus L. Okay, so really close to what Dynair does. And similarly for GU, let's first have a look at the individual entries. Look almost the same, well, they look pretty much the same. 
Again, let's have a look at the norm. Ten to the power of minus twelve. So, very easy our algorithm. Even though there's so much math and so much uh, to understand about the first order perturbation, the actual algorithm is very easy. Okay, there are basically a couple of steps to it. Let me rephrase. First, we need to compute the dynamic Jacobian and evaluate that at the steady state, and then extract those different submatrices. Then I need to compute D and E matrices, do the sure decomposition, reorder it such that the generalized eigenvalues come first, so get the matrix two matrices out of the Z matrix, check the Blanchard count conditions, then recover my GY or GX matrix. Once I have that, very easy to recover GU. Done. 